Dave Stotts is a veteran in this industry, writing, editing, shooting, hosting, and traveling the globe with Cold Water Media to create Drive Through History, a fast-paced and incredibly rich history show that speeds through ancient civilizations. Dave has got to be on his 20th passport at this point, and we're talking with him next. During this week's episode, we're highlighting our recently released Lessons from the Land, the Gospels video series. It's a children's series that consists of 13 video lessons along with a workbook, and we'll have more on that later in the show. Welcome to Inroads, where we talk about the why of Appian Media and how you can use the technology of today to spread the timeless message of the Bible. Learn more about us and watch our free video series at appianmedia.org. Dave Stotts is joining us, quote unquote, in the studio today, zooming in from from his office there in Texas, right? That's right. Excellent. The uh, beautiful Republic of Texas, uh, where sooner or later we're going to secede from the rest of you guys. So uh, (laughs) sorry. I I don't think I was supposed to say that, but uh, nevertheless. Is there like a secret handshake or something that we need to be part of the club before it happens? You just have to be Texan. That's all it is. I just think you have to like brisket. So oh, okay. that's really all the qualifications. You I'm need. in. Yeah. <laughs> so Dave, you're the, you're the host of the Drive Through History series. I'm familiar with the Gospels and the Acts to Revelation. Uh, that's what first uh, was brought to my attention about your work, which is exceptional. It's outstanding. We're thrilled to have you calling in, and we're excited to talk to you about your work and your mission. Thanks, Craig. Stuart, it's great to be with you guys on Inroads today. Thanks for having me on. So before we jump into the, no doubt, countless adventures of your work, uh, just tell us a little bit about yourself, beside the fact that you're, you're in a state that's going to quickly secede. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's going to take a while. I mean, it probably won't happen for a couple more weeks, but okay. uh, the arc doors are closing, guys. So get in that's right. <laughs> while you still can. Um, I live in Texas with my wife and four kids and host Drive Through History, a show that kind of goes on location and takes the viewer on a fast-paced kind of adventure style journey. That's part history documentary, part on location reality show, and with a little bit of humor twisted in there and also uh, uh, with this car theme. So we've cobbled together this this show that we've done seven seasons, about 90 half hour shows, give or take. And um, it's packed with a lot of historical content, but it's also done in a way that's very entertaining, we hope, for our audience. Uh, you know, I wanted to get into this um, media creation industry from as long as I can remember. In high school, I watched movies all the time, and I just thought, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be a filmmaker. I really loved Steven Spielberg. My favorite movie was Raiders of the Lost Ark. And I just, I, you know, I, I don't want to say that I practiced Oscar acceptance speeches when I was in high school, but I'm not saying I didn't, you know. Um, and uh, I, I really wanted to to go out to California and be a filmmaker. And I, it didn't take too long before I realized I wanted to go a different direction. And when it comes to documentaries, it, uh, it it really opened up a lot more possibilities for me. I ended up going to seminary uh, as I graduated from college. And so I had the, the production training. Um, I went to seminary after college. Uh, so I got the Bible training. And somewhere in all that, I got into theater. So I was, a, I was a theater major for a year in college. I did a lot of plays and shows in high school. So when you look at drive Through History, it's kind of a, a, a mashup of all of that. Uh, taking those three things that I feel like I uh, had some experience in and, and used them in a way that I don't think I could have ever really anticipated. Yeah. So it sounds like your, your decision to jump into this, this, this began back in uh, 2004, 2005. Yeah, that's right. I got married in 2003 and the first thing I did was leave my wife for about a month uh, <laughs> on the road, working on our first set of shows that we call the drive through history, ancient history series. And we didn't know what we were doing. We, we, uh, my, my business partner, Jim, um, and I, we, we just were making this up as we went along and had some scripts kind of pre-written little chunks of information, texts, 
uh, in text form that I would go over and, uh, you know, stand in front of this ruin and quickly memorize. And, 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 but again, we didn't have this idea of a full series necessarily. We didn't know what the shows were going to look like. So it really, we came back with all this footage and then it was a matter of, you know, you know, um, creating this mashup of all the little, little tools we had on our palette, which mm -hmm. is obviously lots of footage uh, overseas and, and me looking at the camera talking. But then we just kind of realized, wow, there's a lot of voice over here we have to cover. We got to get artwork. And so artwork has become a huge part of our, our uh, bag of tricks. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think this show would have been possible without the web. And, and artwork is public domain if it's older than 85 years or so. And so we we're able to pull all this Bible art off the web. And what we did is layer it and make it look kind of 3D. We call it 2.5D, yeah. where the images are still flat, but they're in Z space. And so uh, it gives this impression that the paintings kind of come alive. Yes, it's brilliantly done. Yeah. I mean, that's so I assume you're using After Effects for me. I'm kind of, you know, the post production geek here. Um, it's it's such a compelling way because otherwise it's a it's a flat image you're going to start losing your viewers but you really do breathe life into those images and really you're breathing life into history it, that sounds super well, you know, cliche you know, I'm, but I'm, I'm uh, and I'm looking at these paintings from um, these hacks like Rembrandt and uh, and Leonardo da Vinci and you know <laughs> guys like that that guy can totally improve on this and. Uh, it is kind of weird when I'm working on some like famous painting from Raphael or something like that. And I'm using the clone tool in Photoshop and I'm making little adjustments to his masterpiece. I'm thinking there's like, I'm going to go to like painter hell for this or something <laughs> yeah, right. because it's like sacrilege to do, to do such a thing to these paintings. But nevertheless, it's become kind of an expected feature of our show. These, mm -hmm. these layered images and, so we'll do that. That's on the palette of tools we use. We use a lot of maps and timelines and B-roll. Uh, but we only usually have around two cameras rocking at any given time, mm -hmm. two, maybe three. Uh, one of them is, is on me as the host. And since I'm looking into the camera, you only need one camera, right? You don't want to have a second camera and then suddenly I'm profile. Or maybe I get the awkward kind of, this moment you know <laughs> looking over at camera b we don't do that um and, and we do a lot of drone photography and all the rest we've 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 lost a few drones around the world um there's there's one in a tree in the middle of nowhere in ireland and uh one that's at the bottom of the south south china sea oh. in the hong kong bay so that was a that was a fun day nice, nice. we lost that yeah so so dave just kind of tell us a little bit why why did you decide uh, you know, you've worked in media before this. Why did you decide, hey, let's go over here and I want to stand in front of these ruins and start talking about history? Why was that something that you decided to do? Well, like I said, Jim, the executive producer, and I are longtime friends. We collaborated on this idea because we wanted to meet a need of creating a media tool for kind of the middle school age range to get them excited about their faith. The original idea was going to be me playing a character, not playing myself. I was going to be some Sunday school teacher. Uh, and I would, you know, go overseas to do on location Bible stories for my Sunday school class. And we decided that didn't quite work. And, and so I decided to be me. And uh, the, the very first sort of um, experiment we did with it was uh, we were, had a layover in, in the city of Rome. And Jim, uh, we hadn't started drive through history, but he, I think, could see that I might have some potential as the on-camera guy. And I was just the cameraman on this trip. And we had a layover in Rome, and we went down to uh, this ancient road that you guys, I'm sure, are familiar with called the Appian Way. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, It's a 2,000-year-old road with these cobblestones that are massive. And cars actually still drive on the Appian Way even today, even though it's 2,000 years old. And so uh, it's funny, you know, the, uh, the phrase all roads lead to Rome, you know, our, our show started uh, on the Appian Way. So Jim says, uh, hey, uh, take this camera, aim it back on yourself, and uh, why don't you just narrate something about this cool ancient road we're on. And uh, uh, there are some Christian catacombs there that, that you can see um, that are open to the public that 
where early Christian martyrs are, were buried. Um, and he goes, oh, yeah, and rent, rent, a, rent a bicycle and, uh, <laughs> and, and, and aim the camera back on yourself and narrate the Appian Way story while you're on a bike. And so we rented a bicycle, a tourist bike's bicycle. And I go to the back of this bike and I'm trying to, you know, ride along the big cobblestones and cars are whizzing by and I'm trying to remember what the Appian Way is all about. And then I just, I wipe out so hard. <laughs> like I go over my, my, my uh, handlebar is locked to the side and I, it's all slow motion. I, I go over the handlebars. I very heroically cradle the camera mm -hmm. so as to protect our investment. And I just smash into this 2000 year old cobblestone oh. split open my uh uh elbow it's all actually on camera nice. i i it's all the footage is there we put it in an extra feature i think on an old dvd didn't have to bleep out any words or anything like that you'll be happy to know uh, <laughs> it was quite painful and and so jim runs over you know is the is the camera okay you know is the bike all right you know i'm okay too jim <laughs> yeah. thanks and uh so we kind of looked at each other and we realized, you know, obviously this is what God wants us to be doing for the next 20 mm. years. So uh, that went so well. So that really was the first time I ever tried anything like the on-camera hosting thing. I do production. I'm behind the camera. I'm also in the editor's chair. But on this, I, I get out in front of the camera and we go overseas and we, we, we talk about history. We hope and think and pray that in a way that really excites our viewers, reminds them that uh, their faith is founded on um, things that are historically reliable. Mm -hmm. And this has grown, as you mentioned, is this grown from uh, just Bible lands, gospel history to now you're doing American history and you're doing other historical events around the world. So did you find out that, uh, hey, this is pretty popular with uh, like the homeschool crowd. Uh, let's make this really educational as well. Well, that's the great thing about history. Uh, it, they keep making more of it. Uh, and so, you know, there's a lot to cover. And, and really, the, the, we get people all the time telling us, hey, do a series on this or do a series on that. There's so much to, to cover. Yes. I mean, I'll be, you know, long dead before we really begin to scratch the surface. So we've done seven seasons so far. Um, or we're in the process of finishing out seven seasons. We've done about 90 or so half hour episodes. And we found a very, you know, enthusiastic audience through our, our TBN viewers, through local churches and small groups use it a lot. And, uh, and like you said, Stuart, um, our homeschool audience has really grown. Our homeschool families really love to use this tool because as a kind of a, a supplement to a history curriculum and, and uh, and the homeschool market doesn't really have a lot of fast-paced, exciting, you know, um, media at the moment, uh, especially not that's on location. And so we've been able to have these shows uh, at a certain budget level that will allow for um, the kind of show at the production level that we're trying to create mm -hmm. that really fills a, a void in kind of the homeschool media market. So uh, we've, we've really enjoyed reaching out to, uh, to, to, to those, those amazing people. So, so kind of talk about production a little bit. Um, what does the crew look like? What does a, a day in the life in the field look like for you guys? Yeah, our, we try to travel with as small a crew as possible um, just for budgetary reasons, but also because we don't like to call a lot of attention to ourselves. Back in the early days, we didn't even know you had to have permits when you <laughs> showed up at, a, at this you know, UNESCO World Heritage Site or something like that. And uh, so we would just pull the cameras out and start filming. And then we got to the point where it was like, I think we need to like, slip in this little on-camera dialogue stand up that I do when the little guys with the brown coats and blue coats are, you know, looking the other way. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we, we, we realized quickly that we wouldn't be able to, to, to go long-term doing that. So now we, you know, we go through the process of being permitted and all the rest, right. which is uh, an enormous Herculean task that our production, uh, that our producer has to do every time we go. But uh, so our, our crew is pretty small. We've got a guy named Tom. We have a Tom. The, the Avengers have a Hulk. We have a Tom. He is this big dude that is simultaneously our gimbal camera operator and um, 
personal security detail because mm-hmm. the guy's just ripped. Okay. So he's awesome. We, he and I have been working together for most of the history of the series. We can complete each other's sentences. And so he and I work really well together. We'll show up at a relocation, this old ruin, and then we'll just immediately look around. I'll know what he's thinking. He'll know what I'm thinking. And we just jump right into it. And, uh, and I've got usually a few little paragraphs of text that I have to say on camera. We'll bang those out. And then we'll spend the rest of the time there getting B-roll of me walking around looking pensive and profound. And uh, I was like, wow, there's a lot on that guy's mind, you know, and so just me walking around. <laughs> and so and then the other camera guy will be shooting lots of B-roll and culture shots and just, you know, uh, hilts and pans of, of the ancient ruin. And uh, then we'll fly a drone. And we've got this down to a, a pretty tight science uh, that will show up at a spot and and knock it out pretty quick. So uh, about between four and six people on on uh, on the field. Um, and, you know, staying in Airbnbs and hotels along the way and renting cars and, uh, oh, and then, yeah, we've got to get a lot of car shots too. We're always filming cars. The cars, you know, it's really become something too, that we, we won't go, we won't go somewhere with unless we have a car that's pretty interesting when we, when we get there, you know, whether it's a, you know, a vintage Mini Cooper in the UK or it's, um, uh, you know, an old Alfa Romeo in, in Italy, uh, vintage Mercedes in Germany. So we try to keep the cars kind of, you know, unique to that country. We, we got our hands on an old Holden, which no one's ever heard of. It's unique to Australia. And it's this old vintage restored Holden, which looks kind of like a truck. And I'm driving around Sydney and I'm just getting people constantly just, you know, uh, turning heads, looking at this old car and giving me the, you know, thumbs up. And, and I'm just like, Oh, okay. It must be a really cool car here. <laughs> and, uh, and these guys let us borrow their cars. You know, they, um, there's one guy in Paris. He, he, he had restored an old, uh, uh, Citroen, um, or, or Citroen. And, you know, he, you could tell this car is like a child to him. And, you know, here's a bunch of, you know, American dudes coming over asking if we can drive it around Paris. You've driven around Paris. It's um, when you were Tom Cruise on the back of a motorcycle, you know, they, they, they stop the traffic for you, but they don't for us. And so that's, it's like crazy driving there. And uh, I think the last guy, this, the, the last thing this guy said to me as I drove off in his vintage Citroen that I swear he would kill or die for. And I think he said, uh, don't screw this up. You know, he said, he literally says that as I'm driving away thinking, wow, that the the vote of confidence is, is, uh, inspiring. Um, now the vehicles are a big deal for your show. Am I right that there's, that there's a Jeep that you used or a a four by four that you used in the the Bible museum in DC? Yes. So we like Jeeps. Jeeps are, you know, the whole show we try to communicate an idea of we're having an adventure. Yeah. So we're on this journey. And, um, and so a Jeep is the perfect car to communicate that. So we did a series of videos for the museum of the Bible in Washington, DC. Mm-hmm. And we used the Jeep for that. Then we, then we, we took the Jeep and then we, it's, it's actually sitting there in the, in the museum as you're walking into the big theater where we show like a 15 minute kind of orientation video on Bible history. So and just Jeeps are just naturally look cool on camera. Um, and so we try to, you know, get cars that, that make me look tougher than I really am in real life. Right, right. So now it makes a lot more sense. On our last production trip in 2018, Stu had to kind of twist my arm and get us to... to we had to find to just Jeep. the right car. Right. And, and, and Craig like, was like, we just need to go know. from point A to point B. Right. It doesn't really matter. We'll and just Stu's go like, no, no, car. no, th- this is going to be important. And now it's like on all of our marketing materials. So right. yes, yeah. see exactly, it, it, yeah, it becomes exactly. part of you the slap a GoPro on those things, and you've got yeah. you know can edit together a cool little travel sequence right. too between locations. Right. So so I've got to know, um, you've been doing this uh, for fifteen plus years, right? And and you you've been producing things. Uh, Cold Water Media they do things even beyond drive through history. You you've got a a vast amount of experience. What would you say are some of the challenges today for those that are trying to create films about their faith 
whether it's feature films or shows or what are some of the challenges that we're facing in order to effectively do that? What can we do better in this industry? That is a great, that is a very profound question. And I'm, I'm nowhere near qualified really to speak to it broadly. Uh, you know, we got into the education arena, which is not, I mean, I told you I wanted to be a filmmaker and do dramatic films growing up. You know, I, I, by the time I left college, I kind of realized that world really isn't for me. It didn't seem like it's the kind of world that I wanted to, you know, meet a wife and raise a family in Southern California. It's not to say there aren't amazing uh, committed believers out there working even in that industry, but it just wasn't for me. And so I went a different direction and kind of got more in the documentary side of things. Uh, and then it kind of bled into this educational edutainment infotainment um, world that we're in now, which really, again, as I said before, kind of defies a genre. It's, there's really not quite anything uh, out there quite like it, but um, what can we do better? You know, um, I don't think there is a, a worldview, if you will, that is as filled with amazing life-changing stories than Christian history. Mm -hmm. And so I, I don't know if we've really begun to scratch the surface of really using our imagination to, to, to find those stories and incarnate them in the visual media. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot, of, a lot of Christian films, we all complain about Christian movies, and I don't have any desire to pile on. But the stories kind of feel a little bit tired, and, and, um, and the, the, the character is kind of one-dimensional. Uh, the plot's somewhat predictable. And, and, you know, just looking at you guys, uh, I'm sure your lives are not one-dimensional. You're not a one-dimensional Christian. I'm not a one-dimensional Christian. I, I hopefully am a little more complex than that. And I look at history and the saints and sinners that have sort of uh, helped spread the Christian message around the world. They're anything but one dimensional people. They're not, they're very complex, larger than life, colorful men and women and children, even who mm -hmm. can exemplify what it means to be a heroic follower of Christ. Um, and so I don't know if we've really done the hard work of finding those stories that are, that are really inspirational. Mm -hmm. uh, we've been a little bit on autopilot when it comes to uh, creating media. So for us, we've we had the benefit of, um, well, we don't have to create our own stories. We can just look in, in the history books and find them. And what we've found in doing these 90 plus shows, uh, and especially in this most recent series that we're calling Ends of the Earth, um, we're finding stories that are um, completely forgotten, unknown by most of the world, that we are now kind of giving new life by telling these stories of these heroic Christians and, and pastors and monks and priests and itinerant evangelists and lay people who all kind of suffered and gave up something to help spread the Christian message around the world. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, yeah, I, again, we have the benefit of, of doing it documentary style. Um, no shortage of stories to tell there. Right. People have asked us, the, the content that we're creating obviously is focused solely on the biblical narrative. Um, you obviously branch out. People have asked us, well, how long can you keep this up? Right. And even if you just stay within the pages of the Bible, the answer is how, how many lifetimes do you have? Um, exactly. The, the resource is boundless, um, which makes yeah. sense. The message comes from a boundless God, you'd right. think. And I'm sure, I'm sure you find it uh, somewhat relaxing to know that you don't have to write the script yourself. I mean, like, it's like the, the Bible's written, history is written. Uh, you're not having to come up with these stories yourself. So that's kind of a... That's exactly right. And, you know, and, and we, we cobbled together this formula of our show, Drive Through History, with, with a lot of fast-paced, on-location visuals. And we use a lot of maps and graphics. And we make it visually kind of entertaining, but we don't do that because we think the stories are boring. Um, that's, that's really a misnomer that, uh, to, to assume that if you're going to create something exciting and entertaining, well, it's because you think that you've got to hold people's attention and because these stories are, are not exciting. That's, that's not at all our approach. Our approach is that these stories are so exciting. History is so important and life-changing potentially that, they, that these stories deserve to be told in a way that is 
compelling and entertaining for our viewers. And uh, it doesn't have to be the uh, PBS style. It doesn't have to be the uh, Ken Burns style of, of more, you know, really aimed at a, a, a mature kind of person. We can aim for the people who have shorter attention spans like myself uh, and make the shows entertaining. And there's nothing wrong with that. Nothing bad happens when you are making a show that's entertaining and informative at the same time. Yeah. And, you know, with me as the host, you know, I, I don't take myself too seriously. You know, when we handle Bible content, you know, we scaled back the humor in a big way. Uh, I don't know if you've noticed at all, really, in our gospel series. And then we did the Acts to Revelation series. Yes, yeah, we're covering the New Testament right. at this survey, survey level. But you don't want to have, you don't want to make jokes, you know. And, and uh, plus, we're in Israel, you know, a country not known really for sense of humor. For a sense of humor, yep. <laughs> uh, right. So uh, if there ever were you know, laugh to be had. They were usually at my expense. Uh, and so we have a little bit more fun with this uh, ends of the earth series. We're able to, to, you know, poke fun at ourselves in different ways, um, e experiencing these cultures from around the world. So yeah. Um, yeah, but, but, but humor is a, is a big part of it as well. Again, not, not because we disrespect the history, but because we respect it, we want to tell it in a way that's entertaining. Right. And I appreciate so much. You, you guys are bringing history and like you said, even some things that have been forgotten. And it's, it's, it's in order to benefit the generation today for us to learn from the good, the bad, and the ugly from the past. So we really appreciate the work that you're doing. I saw a movie a few nights ago with my son called A Hidden Life. Have you heard of this film? I have not. Um, by a filmmaker named Terrence Malick. Um, it's a true story of, uh, of an Austrian farmer who is raising a family in the mountains in, in, in Austria, and he's being forced to swear allegiance to Hitler. And it's all about what, he, what happens to him when he refuses to do so, mm. and making this decision uh, to not turn his back on his conscience and the overwhelming pressure that's brought to bear on him to do so. Uh, and it, it's, a, it's called A Hidden Life, which exemplifies in so many ways, the approach we took to this ends of the earth series, we're finding people and stories and martyrs and saints and heroes. Nobody would have perhaps ever heard of in our current day and age, uh, forgotten lives, hidden lives. Mm. Um, and, uh, being able to tell their story is, is extraordinarily rewarding. That's awesome. Yeah. We'll tell you what, after the break, we're going to talk to Dave about his latest series, Bible unearthed and what this work has done for his own faith. So let's talk about Lessons from the Land of the Gospels for just a minute. It's now available on our website. You can watch all of the videos completely for free. That's right, they're great for a family devo, a homeschool group who might be looking for history and geography lessons on the Bible or for a church Bible class. There's everything from lessons on the Sea of Galilee and the type of boat Jesus and his disciples might have used to what an oil lamp would have looked like in the first century. Yeah, I've used these with my own kids ages six, four, and two. All three of them will sit on the couch and stay just hooked. Um, I love that there's this fantastic workbook that we have to go along with each video. They've got great activities, discussion prompts, and QR codes at the beginning of every lesson. So you can find the videos and the workbooks on our website appianmedia.org. Now back to the show and our conversation with Dave. So Dave, you've just released, and I just found out about it just a few days ago, uh, a new series uh, in association with, with Right Now Media called Bible Unearthed. It looks amazing. Tell us about this. So Bible Unearthed is um, a series we did kind of in the apologetics realm that uses the data we've been able to discover uh, over the last, ever since the science of archaeology began, uh, to use archaeology as a way to support and buttress the viewer's faith in the historicity of the Christian scriptures. So we have become good friends with a guy named Titus Kennedy. He's a PhD uh, archaeology guy who's young and energetic and pretty cool and great sense of humor. Uh, we've used him uh, a lot when we travel for drive-through history in Israel. And so 
we put together this series to um, take all the research that he's been able to do over the years, much of which we use in drive through history, to be honest, and put that in a form that the churches and home groups can use to become introduced to this science of archaeology and all the data that, that supports the gospel. So we took a, uh, a studio, made it into a man cave. <laughs> uh, we went over to Israel with Titus and, and got a lot of footage of him kind of in the field on a dig. So here's a guy who actually goes on digs. He's not just an uh, ivory tower archaeologist. He's constantly working in the field. He's, he kind of rolls out his greatest hits of all these things that we've discovered over the, uh, over the decades. Not when I say we, I mean the archaeological community for that support, often to the surprise of the archaeological establishment. Mm -hmm support the historical reliability of the Bible. So uh, we're really excited about how it's going to, I think, strengthen the, the faith of the viewers uh, that, um, that see it. And uh, so we, in me and Titus, and we also bring in Randall Niles, who's a good friend and writer of the show. And the three of us just kind of sit around a table and, and talk archaeology. Which is which was a lot of fun. So, so you kind of touched on a point that uh, you know I wanted you to elaborate on. You know, why is studying archaeology uh, helpful for growing somebody's faith? Great question. You, you know, I I was raised a Christian. Um, I never knew a day really of unbelief. To be honest, I was in somewhat of a bubble. I think growing up, and and uh, but that's not to say that you still don't wrestle with with questions mm -hmm. about your faith. And I think if we keep people in a bubble and don't expose them to questions or don't allow them to ask questions, then I think the faith maturation process gets sort of stunted. And, and so uh, what archaeology does is it actually takes on head on some of the challenges to the historical questions of Christian history and Bible history. And uh, and, and rather than kind of denying those questions exist and looking the other way, we kind of face them head on and steer right into them mm -hmm. and say, okay, let's look, let's, let's see what's there to see that can support the Israelite conquest, for example, or let's see what's there to see uh, when it comes to um, the witness of the early apostles. Uh, and there's a lot there to see. And so I know my faith has been extremely uh, fortified over the years working on this kind of content. You know. Um, when doubts kind of creep into a person's mind and heart, being able to remind them that, look, your faith is not simply founded on a personal experience. You know, those are important. Having, you know, uh, a relationship, a unique personal relationship with Jesus is, is extremely important, but it's not enough to, to, to always build an entire faith system on. You need something that reminds you that, yeah, your faith actually has global cultural implications because it actually did take place mm -hmm. in time, space, history. There's a lot of, of evidence for it. And, and so um, in a way, you know, if we were able to inoculate uh, a younger audience against some of the, the challenges and questions that are going to come at them, especially if they go off to college, then uh, I think we're doing them a, a, a service. Um, and and uh, so that's what we're excited about yeah. when it comes to Bible unearthed and, and then drive through history as well. Yeah, that's so important. God requires faith, but he doesn't require a blind faith. Right. He doesn't just say, believe me because I told you. Um, God is wise enough and thoughtful enough to us frail humans to litter the world with evidence. I mean, there's so much out there that really solidifies this thing as more than just a, a fantasyful fairy tale. Mm -hmm. So I love That's the work exactly that right. you guys are That's doing, exactly right. yeah. um, especially yeah. to prep the next generation, perhaps with, with tools and answers that, that many of us maybe didn't have when we were growing up. Right. Absolutely. So go back 15 years for us, Dave. If you could tell the, your 2005 self something that you didn't know about drive through history um, and, and making this show kind of give them some, give him some tips. What would you say to him? I would say to avoid the salad at a particular restaurant in, <laughs> uh, in rural Turkey, uh, because, uh, they might use the local water source to clean the vegetables. Oh. Uh, and, uh, yeah. And especially avoid that salad on the day before you board an airplane oh, to, 
to, to go back overseas, to go home. Um, yeah. Sounds like a rough so that, life. that was, that was a lesson learned. I've learned a lot of lessons, you guys. I mean, you know, uh, don't get too close to a camel's face. Uh, I got bit, I got bit by a camel one time. I, the camel actually didn't just bite me, it bit my face. Oh no. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. You, you don't want to mess with this. No, no. Come that's on. the moneymaker there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I, I kind of got down like right up in his grill and was kind of goofing off and, and, uh, you know, you don't think of a, of a camel having like Cobra, like ninja, you know, uh, moves. And this thing just turned its head and just boom, and mouth bit on my cheek and I could, you could slow it down. I could frame by frame and you can actually see his teeth, like with my cheek in the teeth. Yeah. And, uh, luckily I moved away very fast, uh, reflexively as you would expect. So cameras and, um, were rolling. Am I so right? Cameras where, were rolling. Where do yeah, we get access to this clip? But there is, there is, uh, there is not enough hand sanitizer in the Middle East to to wash off the the shame of that moment. I'll tell you that right now. Um, I mean, those things are nasty. Those camels are disgusting. Um, yeah. So you're probably looking for more profundity than that, aren't you? Uh, when it comes to go back 15 years and and uh, I know that's some good tell, tips. Don't yeah. get bit by a camel. I mean, yeah. don't get bit by a camel and avoid locally washed produce. Um, I probably would journal more. I mean, the, you know, there is so much and you guys have been on the field, you travel, um, you just get cloudy. You mm-hmm. forget things that, that, that happen. I mean, you know, jet lag is, is, is a real phenomenon, isn't it? I mean, you guys have oh, yeah. experienced it. You know, somebody said that jet lag is, is nature's way of actually making you look like your passport photo. <laughs> um, it, it just does a number on, on your body and, and, and on your mind. Um, you know, I, you know, I took off from Sydney to come home. I left at one thirty on a Sunday afternoon and got home at one o'clock on a, on that same Sunday oh, afternoon. You now try explaining that to an eight year old boy, yeah. one, my son, it's just mind blow. Uh, yeah. So I, you know, really soaking in the history there. I've been to Israel about eight or nine times and it never gets old. Mm-hmm. It's always electric to me whenever I go to Jerusalem. Um, and, 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 but we're so busy and we're just there to get the shots and, and, and put these things together. And I come home and I realize, wait a second, I just, I just walked where Jesus walked. Did I really soak it in the way I should? Did I really crack my Bible and, and have my quiet times there in, you know, in that amazing location. Yeah. Uh, did I appreciate it personally? You know, I'm trying to make a show where there are viewers can do that and, and sometimes forget to do that myself. Yeah. yeah. Just putting, putting the viewfinder down for a moment and actually taking it in with your own eyes rather through the lens of a, a camera, something it's easily forgotten. Mm-hmm. That's exactly right. And, and, and I'm not the cameraman, so I don't have to put the the viewfinder down. I'm the the guy walking around trying to look um, pensive <laughs> in these ruins, and uh, you know I need to be praying more and thinking more. And I do sometimes. You you see me on camera walking around. I'm praying sometimes, and but sometimes I'm thinking um, I probably look really fat in these pants. So you know um, it's it's a real thing. Yeah. Vanity can creep in when you're the on camera guy. It, it is a strange thing so, when you're when you're producing a scene say in the garden of Gethsemane or something. And you're like, after 30 minutes, you're like, all right, guys, let's pack it up and head out. And you're like, wait a second. <laughs> right. Yeah. Let's go. Where let's are go we? Get some, <laughs> Important some happened to you. Yeah. Kebabs. Yeah. yeah. Wow. So we love to ask this of all of our guests, Dave, um, are there any specific digital tools that you have found helpful in your own Bible study and teaching? So what, what would you recommend? What do you find helpful as you're considering the word? You know, that's the one question I, I, that you guys gave me that I was the hardest for me because I don't know if I've really been able to seize upon anything unique there. I, other than just kind of online search tools and things like that. Um, I guess we're trying to create a tool for people that would be, mm-hmm. that would be that. So, uh, but I, I confess, I don't sit, sit at home and watch drive through history. I'm busy at the office making it. I don't even watch my kid, make my kids watch it. It's um, <laughs> they do sometimes. 
when the coronavirus hit, we were all stuck at home. And so we, we definitely watched more. It's just a little weird for them to see their dad up on screen and they get kind of, kind of weirded out by that. <laughs> um, plus I'm not sure my fragile ego could handle it. If I looked over and they, they were bored That's or something right. like that, I don't <laughs> Yeah. Um, you know, I'm pretty, I'm kind of old school, uh, when it comes to, to digital Bible study tools. Um, I, I try not to reinvent the wheel too much when it, when it comes to that. I'd be more curious what you guys can share with me um, when it comes to research. And our research is done with, 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 with guys like Titus and Randall, who, who are our main researchers and writers. Um, so uh, I, I'm not sure I, I have a real silver bullet on that. Sure. One. I mean, it sounds like you've already mentioned it, especially before we started recording, but just the internet in general. Yeah is obviously something you guys have made great use of that wasn't available right. 30, 40 years ago. And so just having that at your fingertips, um, I do find myself yeah. during Bible studies, I've got my phone open, usually pulled open yeah. to some kind of website um, yeah. to, to help me better dig deeper. And the fact that everybody's got that at your fingertips right. um, is phenomenal. Mm -hmm. Well, when I read the Bible, I... I try to resist the temptation to let it just feel like um, that, well, I can make this mean anything I want. Uh, I can kind of mm -hmm. do anything I want with this. And I do believe the Holy Spirit can guide you and, and influence you as you read the Bible. It's inspired text. But to me, it's 10 times more interesting to understand the context mm -hmm. and the historical location and people to whom it was initially written. In fact, I don't, I try to not let an interpretation of any part of the Bible be separate completely from what it would have meant to its initial hearers. Yeah. Um, so I think that's kind of helps me kind of put some guardrails on, on how far I can go in my own kind of private um, sure. interpretation right. of the Bible, which can be a dangerous thing sometimes. Right. So I imagine we've got plenty of, of listeners here, and this will be our final question, but who, who see what you do. And they're listening to what sounds like an amazing adventure. Yeah. Um, what would you say to someone who's wanting to perhaps start writing or directing or creating media like yours? Um, what kind of advice would you give those budding filmmakers? There's never been a better time than now to get into content creation and media creation. Now, yes, there are a lot of people doing it. Tools are everywhere, but that just means that they're easier to get. Mm-hmm. Um, it doesn't mean you're automatically going to be good at it. I mean, you know, when they started mass producing pencils, it didn't make, turn everybody into a sketch artist. Right. Um, but the tools were there and, and it broke down the barriers to entry and it's democratized the industry in, in a way that nobody probably could have ever anticipated. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, not having to rely upon big dinosaur media distribution companies. You can go directly, as you guys podcasters know, you go directly to your audience. Mm -hmm. And, um, and there's, a, there's a term for that, over the, isn't it? Over the top media. You're, you're kind of going over the heads of, mm -hmm. of the, the gatekeepers and you can deliver directly to your audience. And if you find a big enough audience, they can, they'll come back for more. And there are ways to, to monetize that. There are ways to, to, to build um, a brand. And when it comes to cameras and gear, never a better time. I mean, what I'm filming myself on today is a camera that I could not have even dreamed was available 10 years ago. It's in the, my pocket and, and, so, and everyone's got them. And so uh, finding, you know, little stabilizers, little microphones to kind of turn your phone into a more of a production camera. Now it's not going to be like a, like a cinema camera. It's not going to be even like a high end DSLR, but it's a start. Yeah. Right. And you can flip it back on yourself and maybe even try the, the hosting thing. You know, they're, you know, one of the big missing links in a lot of, um, uh, content creation is the lack of, uh, a, a host or a talent who the audience can relate to. And so developing that side, that skill set is really critical. Um, in fact, we're going to come to a point where, you know, we need to find talent. It's not easy to do. Um, you know, looking into a camera lens is about the most awkward thing you can possibly do and pretend you're actually having a conversation mm -hmm. with right. someone. 
and and uh, probably some th- theater training may have helped in that. I, I I'm I'm just uh, I'm enough of a performer and I'm shallow enough that I can actually pretend to be talking to somebody when I'm actually not. <laughs> when I'm just looking into looking into this imposing glass eyeball of a of a of a camera lens. But you know, I would just say there's no better way to cre- create learn how to create than just jumping in and mm-hmm. getting your feet wet. The tools are there. There are no barriers to entry anymore. Even even uh, post-production stuff. Um, if you um, are a student and want to subscribe to the Adobe Creative Cloud, the creative suite of, of apps, it's not difficult to do. So there, there are a lot of exciting opportunities to just make stuff. I, I tell people all the time, watch people, go to Vimeo, uh, watch, uh, go to their staff picks and learn from filmmakers some techniques and just, you know, copy. Nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with looking at something and then trying to reverse engineer it and say, okay, here's how they did that. I'm going to try to do the same thing and learn from them and then put a twist on it later on that's more signature, that's more unique. And um, so, yeah, I, I, I think there's really no, nothing holding people back anymore from, from getting their hands on some pretty amazing tools and, 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 and not just to, to make stuff for the sake of making stuff. You know, you've heard the phrase, don't just say something, have something to say, right? As Christians, we have the best thing to say. We have a message that actually seeded the culture and created Western civilization. And we're all living off the fumes of that right now. And there are ways in which it's perhaps kind of crumbling at the moment. We need people to tell the story of the Christian message uh, in a way to remind people that, hey, this actually has an objectively good contribution to the history of Western civilization. Let's not let it get taken away. Absolutely. Um, so yeah, that's, uh, that's what I would say. I would get your hands on tools. There's nothing holding you back and just start making stuff. Even, even if it's really, really bad at first. I mean, my first uh, time in front of the camera, I was very, very flat, talk too fast. Uh, and I'm, I can't hold a candle to some hosts that I respect. I mean, you know, I mean, guys like Mike Rowe and all the rest that just exude expertise and, and all that they do. You know, I've got to kind of memorize what I say because I don't want to mess it up. You know, facts and figures are important to not mess up. So, uh, but just kind of learning how to, um, to, to, to work on that skill set. There's nothing holding you back. Yeah. Right. Dave, this has been fantastic. Yeah. I'm, I'm really excited that we could have this conversation. Thank you for carving out some time for us and, and sharing your message. It's awesome. Keep up the good, good work. Thank you guys. And you guys too. I'm excited to, to delve into what you guys are doing. It looks like it's pretty exciting stuff. Maybe we'll cross paths, um, you know, on the road someday. Absolutely. Uh, I'd love and, that. um, yeah, and I can, I can tell you the, the, uh, restaurant to avoid in Turkey. That's good. <laughs> That's really good advice. <laughs> Inroads is a production of Appian Media. We're a nonprofit video production company that is 100% crowdfunded. So if you're interested in learning more about how you can support Appian Media so we can continue to create more great free content, visit us at appianmedia.org slash inroads. On the next episode, we'll talk with Chris Emerson, preacher from Texas, new blog writer, but you may know him as the host of the Excel Still More podcast. We'll talk with him next time on Inroads. <laughs>